ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. so much for having me back. <laughs> this is going to be a fun conversation. I'm so excited for this one. We are without our leader, Kristen Lopez, for our second and final episode, rounding out this month's theme of international titles. But we still have one more amazing foreign film to discuss. And to help us do that, we've brought on the most wonderful guest. He's the founder and president of the Film Noir Foundation, host of Turner Classic Movies, and prolific author of several incredible books about noir and film. Most notably, his newest book of cocktail recipe is called Eddie Muller's Noir Bar. He's one of my heroes, one of the greatest film minds on the planet. It's Eddie Muller. How are you, Eddie? <laughs> well, after that introduction, I'm feeling even better. I felt okay when I started the day, but now after getting that big boost, I just feel fantastic. Thank you very much, Samantha. And it's good to see you, Emily, as well. Nice to meet you. Eddie is here with us today to discuss the incredible, iconic 1958 French noir, Elevator to the Gallows. But before we do that, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features, looking at remakes, and based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. We also give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guest on an episode. That's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget to order Kristen's book, but have you read the book, 52 Literary Gems That Inspired Our Favorite Movies, wherever you get books. And our new Redbubble store has fabulous art designed by me and Terrence Holt, featuring some of your favorite stars, including our popular Makoko mugs. That's all at redbubble slash ticklishbiz. Now back to Elevator to the Gallows. I just have to start out by asking you guys, What is your first experience with this movie? Because this is just such a unique film. And I have to throw it out there myself. I'll answer the question first by saying that the first time I ever saw this film was on Noir Alley. (laughs) I'm glad I could be of service. (laughs) I have been wanting to see it. I was familiar with Jean Moreau and French film, of course. But this was just that one movie. It just looks amazing, and somehow it even blew those expectations out of the water. What about you guys? Eddie, what was your first introduction to this movie? (laughs) Well, years ago, I'm afraid to say exactly how many years ago, because you two probably weren't yet on the earth. (laughs) I worked at a magazine, and there was an ad salesman at this magazine where I worked. His name was Philippe Cuiteau. Needless to say, he was French, and he would drive me absolutely crazy with his insistence that I had to see Ascension pour le Chiffon. And he would only call it Ascension pour le Chiffon. He would only discuss this movie by its French title, and I had no idea what he was talking about, of course. Eventually, it all came together. And thanks to Philippe's insistence, I finally did see the movie at a rep house in San Francisco and had much the same reaction that you had, Samantha. It blew me away because there's so many unusual and unexpected things about the film, the way it's shot and the way it's structured and just the unusual storytelling, which I presume we'll get into. Emily, what was your first exposure to this movie? Watching it for this episode, because fortunately or unfortunately, I'm more of a book person than I am a movie person. So Journey Ticklish Business has been a wonderful film education. And I love noir literature. I love noir books. And I was super excited that this was going to be viewing something that's taking place in a time period that I love, which is post-war Europe and post-war America, and dealing with one of my favorite literary genres, but on screen. I'm so in love with this movie. It has so many political things happening and so many gender role things happening and so many deep, dark, scary, wonderful societal things happening. I dug into it wholeheartedly. I'm thrilled with this movie. (laughs) Wow. Okay. That's fantastic. I'm going to sit back and listen to you guys discuss this film, (laughs) I think. That's just sensational. For those who don't know what the film is about, 
she should. You got to see Elevator to the Gallows. <laughs> this is one of those movies. We have talked about a few out of the way films on the show this year. This is one. I'm telling you guys, if you haven't seen it, you should see it. I'm already making that claim now. If you're not familiar with the plot, it revolves around Florence Carala, who's played by Jean Moreau, who has convinced her lover, Julienne Tavernier, I'm going to pronounce all these French names wrong, I'm trying my best, played by Maurice Rone, to kill her husband, who also happens to be his boss, so that they can be together. Without giving too much away, Julienne commits the murder, but is then stuck in his workplace's elevator, and chaos ensues when Florence believes that he has jilted her. And his abandoned car ends up being used for nefarious purposes, which ends up damning Julian even further. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, pretty good recap of the yeah, plot or setup, at yeah, least. I don't want to yeah. give it all away, but no, no, no. The thing that's unfortunate, Samantha, is that several of the things I love best about this movie you can't speak of if people haven't seen the movie because the setup for the whole film. I mean. The romantic longing of this movie is so fascinating because you never see the lovers together in the film. It's one of the real fascinating things about the movie is that he's trapped in an elevator, for God's sakes. It's like, who would have thought, right? And some of the most emotional and powerful stuff in the film is just shots of Jean Moreau walking around Paris. They're so gorgeous, and, you know, the score by Miles Davis is probably what this movie is most famous for, which we can talk about how it was composed. That's not spoiling anything. It is a pretty interesting film. I just want to preface our conversation by saying one thing that I always found very intriguing about this. When I saw it the first time, I wasn't anywhere near the quote-unquote expert on films that I supposedly am today. I didn't really get how this movie is placed in the scheme of French cinema historically, because I thought it was a French New Wave film, like with Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut, but it really isn't. It might be splitting hairs, but Louis Mal, the director of this film, preceded the French New Wave a bit. And there were other filmmakers like Jean-Pierre Melville, and Claude Chabrol and Louis Mal, who are not really part of that new wave movement for various interesting reasons. But he was considered more an establishment filmmaker, even though he was very young at the time, but he wasn't part of that cadre of film critics who became cineasts, if you will, and really changed movies in the 1960s. That's why I find it interesting that this film shares so much in common with several other new wave movies, most notably Godard's Breathless. The whole plot about those kids who steal the car is like that movie to come. It's like anticipating Breathless in three years, I guess. Just an observation. I was talking to Emily before we started recording. I mentioned to her, when it came to choosing the films for this international month that we're doing, I kind of realized that most of my international film viewing really lies within the silent era or within the late 50s, 60s. The more I sit here listening to you guys and the more I'm thinking about it, I honestly think that part of the reason for me why I gravitate towards international film during those two periods of film history is because they were really stepping outside of the box during those very important periods of transition. This film is such a great example of that. I completely agree. And it's always interesting to me to see trends in filmmaking and how we learned to make movies. And you see these influences popping up. And it's always so valuable to go back and review all of this stuff. But from my perspective, people are always saying, what was the first noir film? Where did noir start? And I always caution people that it doesn't really work that way. The way artists are influenced and the way things get absorbed into the normal style and fabric of filmmaking, it's not like there are these signposts, you know, that exist that it's like everything is different after this. When you write about film, you love 
to say that stuff. You love to say nothing would ever be the same after Citizen Kane was released. And it's like, yeah, but it didn't happen overnight, right? I mean, it takes a long time for this stuff to be absorbed into the the bloodstream, if you will. And for artists to just say, well, yeah. And it always fascinates me when you see filmmakers today doing things and they think they're coming up with this idea. <laughs> and it's like, have you seen Abel Gantz's Napoleon? There isn't a single camera technique that is not in that film made in the late 20s. Everything, moving camera, handheld camera, 360 degree pans, all this. It's all been done. But how influential was it at the time? Not very. It takes a long time for this stuff to seep in. It's definitely very standing on the shoulders of giants. And then that chain continues through film. 60s French New Wave is so inspired by that transitional silent film period where you find a lot of those very inventive camera techniques first being used, which I think is so interesting. And what's also interesting is the fact that Louis Malle, this was his first movie and he was mm -hmm. only 25 years old. Yeah, it's very, very sophisticated. I liked what Emily was saying about how much substance is in this film and how much it is about things that are almost particularly French in some cases, which shouldn't detract for some people. It's interesting. When I show foreign films on TCM, I get an interesting mixed response. <laughs> there are people who are so grateful for it, and I get long lists sent from some people. Well, now that you've shown this, and whether it's a film like Elevator to the Gallows or Bob Le Flambeur, Melville's film, which is kind of the same thing. It's also a noir from the mid-50s that is a precursor to the new wave. It's not part of it. But then there are people who say, knock it off. Stick with the American stuff. That's what film noir is. I so enjoy sharing my, dare I say, my journey with all of this stuff because there came a point when I thought it was all American. That was who made noir. I mean, it came from Hollywood. And over the years, since I wrote my first book on the subject, I now see that it was a completely international phenomenon. And it was the cross-pollination between cultures was so extraordinary. What the French got from American crime fiction and what the Americans took from the French poetic realism in the late 30s. And and you can see it in their importation of certain actors, like when Jean Cabin came to the United States to make movies. It didn't really work out. <laughs> and then he went back to France and became an even bigger star. I find all this stuff endlessly fascinating, and I think people are really missing an opportunity to broaden their perspective not just on movies, but on the world, if they just flat out say, oh, I don't watch a movie if it has subtitles. I can't believe at this point we're still going through this, but I've learned over time that everything just cycles around again. I mean, I got used to watching subtitles 50 some odd years ago, right? They don't slow me down at all watching the movie, but there are people who watch TCM who do not want subtitles. I was going to say, it's such an interesting thing that, that people couldn't fully grasp, just like the way that the world wars changed the way that countries sort of swap culture, and especially post-World War II when telecommunications were advancing at just absolutely astronomical speeds. There's a reason why Black jazz artists from the United States went to France in order to cultivate cafe society and things along mm -hmm. those lines. The cross-cultural trading was just absolutely elemental to how we understand music, film, books from the 19-teens onward. I get so many reminiscences in this film specifically of Hitchcock. As a Hitchcock nerd, the irony and the little F you to the murderer, how he always thinks that his plan is going to go perfectly and then it goes wrong in the most hilarious and sarcastic way when he doesn't expect it. I feel like that's so Hitchcock, the way that he gets stuck in the elevator. When he goes to retrieve the grappling hook, if he had remembered to do that, he would have <laughs> committed the perfect crime. Yes. I just feel like that's stick. so Hitchcock. 
It's so funny. (laughs) Well, yes, the irony and the coincidences and things. I very much agree that there is a very much a Hitchcock element to it. And of course, you know that the French were devotees of Hitchcock long before he really caught on in America. They appreciated him as a filmmaker in this country because he made great entertainments. But in France, he was revered as a film artist. You really see his influence. Claude Chabrol, of course, made an entire career out of being the French Alfred Hitchcock. Henri-Georges Clouseau is another one. He and Hitchcock competed to see who would get the rights to the novel Diabolique. Clouseau got it, and Hitchcock didn't make that film. Instead, he took a different book by the same authors and turned it into Vertigo. It's very interesting to see all the, like I say, the cross-pollination. In this movie, you get, just like what you were saying about the black jazz artists, finding a more welcoming home in France. That was definitely the story with Miles Davis in this movie, that he was actually on tour in France, and the producer of the film invited him to come in and provide this score. And my understanding, there's a lot of legend about this, but my understanding was that Louis Mal just basically showed him the movie, and Miles Davis went back to his hotel room and sort of noodled around and thought it through, and then came back with a pickup band and just improvised the score while he watched the movie projected. It's astounding. It is one of the great scores ever for a movie. It's just so brilliant how this one guy just felt it. He just felt it as he watched the movie and played it. It's absolutely brilliant. I think Jean Moreau was a huge inspiration as well. (laughs) She was present through the whole thing. And I think Miles Davis and Jean Moreau had a chemistry, shall we say, that certainly helped in the creation of the score. It had so much tonally to the movie of just the the chaos of this sort of era of jazz. It's a little bit beboppy. It had so much confusion and tension, the undercurrent to what's happening on screen, that even though I knew going into this that Miles Davis did the score, I had never heard it before. I just couldn't imagine it with the traditional strings or movie symphony soundtrack at all. There's no way. No, it's in such a minor key. The whole thing is in such a minor key that if they had done it with an American style score, it would have been overwrought. They would have felt nothing is really happening in this movie, (laughs) right? Because in fact, Jean Moreau is alone for most of the film. She's just wandering the street. You never saw this one remade in the States because I don't think conceptually people could get their head around. It's a suspense film in which no one is directly in conflict. With the young couple, yes, there are some confrontations there. But the main plot is just played out. It's the separation between the lovers that is the thing that's so tense. Are they ever going to unite? And then, of course, I'm not going to spoil it, but that is one of the great last shots in the movie is, you guys know. (laughs) You finally do get them together in the last shot of the movie, but again, it's one of those little twists of irony that make the film so special. I will say, just to touch back on Miles Davis, the score has become now such a gateway drug for new people to watch this film when other elements of the film may not have been. I put this movie on and I watched it with my fiance and he has a music degree. Never really watched any noir or any f- films really <laughs> before we met. But he was like, oh, Miles Davis, that's awesome. <laughs> so I just feel like that's just such a great connection for people to now watch the movie. Absolutely. And now you can. A million of other reasons. (laughs) Well, now you can get him to watch a bunch of other mid 50s film noir because that's where jazz really came into its own. It's so funny that my entire life, when I've written about noir, people have an idea in their head of what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And they think it's like a saxophone, a lonely saxophone, and Mm -hmm. a bass and piano. That was never the case. 
It's all orchestral scoring in the 1940s. All of those movies, it's Max Steiner, it's Mm -hmm. Hugo Friedhofer, it's Roy Webb, Miklos Roja, especially composing orchestral scores. It wasn't until the 1950s that you started to get jazz musicians coming in and doing scores, like the stuff Elmer Bernstein did, Man with the Golden Arm and Sweet Smell of Success. And of course, one of my personal favorites is Odds Against Tomorrow, which has a score by John Lewis and the Modern Jazz Quartet that is every bit as different and as innovative as the Miles Davis score on Elevator to the Gallows. But it's an American film. And I think that they were, well, Harry Belafonte produced that movie, and so he certainly knew who John Lewis was. Milt Jackson playing the vibes, and, all, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful score. Louis Miles and Miles Davis on Elevator to the Gallows is what inspired Harry Belafonte to get John Lewis to do the score for Odds Against Tomorrow. It's great that it started a whole movement. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that because that makes me think of the reverse with a movie like I Wake Up Streaming that uses regurgitated 20th Century Fox-owned music in just (laughs) the oddest spots, and it doesn't work. It brings down the whole movie as a result, in my opinion, in spots. And that's why a movie like this, I just feel like when you make a specific score for the film and it really enhances the action, it makes it so much more of a success. It's funny, you know, Not only does I Wake Up Screaming overuse Alfred Newman's street scene theme. So many times. But suddenly it's somewhere over the rainbow is playing like multiple times during the movie. Still a mystery to me as to why that ends up in the film. How did that happen? And it's just so inappropriate. And it's there, but I find myself, I have stopped warning people about it. Because then once you warn them, it's all they hear. (laughs) And so it's like, maybe they'll figure this out for themselves. And I cannot tell you, every time I show that movie, people come up to me and say, what the hell was going on with the score for that film? They hear it themselves. They don't need me to lead them to that. It's so funny because the only thing I can think of is that maybe it just wasn't quite as identifiable. Only a few years later, it wasn't the cultural phenomenon that it is now. I imagine maybe back then people might have heard it and been like, oh, it might have been from Wizard of Oz, but they didn't really be like, oh, yeah, that's definitely from Wizard of Oz like it is now. But it just goes to show that a good score can make or break a movie. Yeah, absolutely. That is absolutely true. And it's funny that I don't think people were quite as, they borrowed much more liberally back then from each other. It's always been a litigious business, but there weren't quite as many lawyers patrolling all of this stuff. A couple of weeks ago on Noir Alley, I showed this movie, Flaxy Martin, a Warner Brothers film. And at the moment, I forget who wrote the music, but I made the comment that he could have been sued for plagiarism because he totally robbed Alfred Newman's streets scene score but changed a note at the very end of the very recognizable bar. And that was it. It's like, no, it's not the same. There's a note that is different. And I almost felt like it was a gag. Like Hollywood was such a small town then that a composer was actually riffing on that theme as an in-joke, since Fox puts it in every single crime movie that they made. And so it's like, watch this. As he's going down the street, we're just going to play this and see if anybody notices. <laughs> and I of course, like 60, sampling now. 65 years later, some dude has a TV show on some network and he's pointing this out. And they say, oh, it took 65 years for somebody to notice that. We have to talk about our leads, too. We have to give some time to Jean Moreau and also... Our lead actor, Maurice Rone, I had never seen anything of either of them before this. This is just your starter film, I think, for them. From what I was reading, this is the first that we really see Jean Moreau undone. She was usually so pristine on screen in her other French films. And it was to the point where the people producing this movie 
on the cutting room floor, they saw this, they saw how Louis Maul made her look and they didn't want to print it. At one point, she was used the way Brigitte Bardot was used in her early films. She was the French sex kitten. And she was the sexy woman hanging around the club that Jean Gabin just took over or something. Jean-Pierre Melville used her that way a couple of times as well. But I agree, with this film, it was something different. She had a much earthier, I don't know how you would describe it exactly, she was just mature. She was a mature woman in this film. And then, of course, she just exploded internationally. She was pretty much known in France. I want to say it was when Truffaut cast her in Jules and Jim, that that was where her international fame just skyrocketed. Have you joined Ticklish Business Patreon? You should, just like Abby Moore, Amy Hart, Andrew Hopp, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Jacob Haller, McF, and Melanie. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guests on an episode. You also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Doubled Features, and special limited series like Being Elvis and Six Weeks with the Thin Man. It's all patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. And she really is a remarkable actress. I'm trying to think of the name of it now, but I recently watched her in a film. It wasn't a French film. I think it was a British movie much later in her career where she was an older woman. And she was just magnificent. She was so unafraid to be exactly who she was and just show it on camera. And she could still be uh, incredibly sexy without hiding anything about who she was. And as she aged, she aged. She got visibly older and had no fear about being exactly that age on screen. I find that very commendable. There's definitely a realism with French films that we don't find anywhere in Hollywood. Just the fact that you're able to see her walking down the street, rain covering her face to the point where if Joan Crawford was walking down the street in that shot, she would have been wearing a pound of makeup and it all would have been melting off. (laughs) Yes, precisely. It's just such a stark contrast to what Hollywood was doing at the time. And it was just so unique and so beautiful. It just ends up being... The most beautiful shot of the film for me is just her walking down the street. That's all you need. Absolutely. With the tears and the tears and the rain. Jetan. Jetan. It's fantastic. Now, have you seen Purple Noon? That's another great Maurice Mm -hmm. Rone film where he's with Alain Delon. If you have not seen that film, I highly recommend it. It's the original version of the talented Mr. Ripley, which was made years later with Matt Damon and Jude Law. Maurice Rone plays the Jude Law character in the original film. That's just a fantastic, full-blown color film noir. I'm sure, Emily, you must be a Patricia Highsmith fan if you like your noir literature. And I'm a huge Patricia Highsmith fan. And I was actually speaking with Samantha before we started recording about how much this film reminded me of The Talented Mr. Ripley, which came uh, out in book form a couple years before this film came out, because that tension of will they ever be caught is so completely drawn out in this and that anxiety that builds throughout, obviously, the talented Mr. Ripley as he's going about in Italy and living a very full life, whereas these people are much more constrained and enclosed and the threat is a little bit higher in this of being caught out. If you love the tension of the talented Mr. Ripley, you will feel it wholeheartedly in this film. Yes, exactly. I think if someone's been listening to this episode, we can stop spoiling the movie. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to get a bit of a back and forth because as you mentioned, we don't see the two lovers together on screen. And what's even more interesting Beyond the fact that we don't see the lovers together on screen, they're really just the two pillars of the film, and they don't interact directly, which I find so inventive. What do we think of alternate endings? (laughs) Is this Uh, the way we want it? I'm not one for that. 
I love the ending of this film. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm happy to hear your alternate ideas. It's interesting. When I watch movies, I never want to change the ending of the story so much as I'm curious about what happens to certain characters whose plot lines are unresolved in the film. And I've actually written several short stories and things that stem from, so what happens next? So what happens at the end of this story? It's especially great when there are ambiguous endings. Like, as you may know, my favorite movie of all time is In a Lonely Place, the Humphrey Bogart, Gloria Graham film. It's such a mature ending for a film because nobody dies. They just end up separate. But it's always fascinated me. Like, so what happens to those characters next? So I don't write a different ending. I tend to extend it and say, so did Dix ever write another movie? Did he end up doing something stupid and getting killed in a fracas on a street corner somewhere? And what happened to Laurel? Did she move away? What happened? That's the way I think about things more than I'd rather change. Because you know that that movie also had a famously different ending that he actually does in the original version of In a Lonely Place. He actually kills her. Dix kills Laurel at the end of the film. And they said, no, that's too melodramatic. For once, a Hollywood movie played it French and said, we're just going to let it lie. And they walk away at the end and that's it. Samantha, I'm curious to know, it sounds like you have an idea for an alternative ending of Elevator to the Gallows. No, I wanted to hear everyone's thoughts on just whether they liked the ending. I do love it. I don't know if I would change anything. If I would say it reminds me of anything, it gives me very strong Remember the Night vibes. If you've seen that, where Barbara Stanwyck, she has been found guilty of the crime. She's going to jail. But it gives you so much hope for the couple anyway. (laughs) This is really similar in that sense, where we find out, yes, everyone's going to pay for their crimes. but you might only get 10 years for good behavior. (laughs) And then they might be together again. He doesn't even have to try to make it hopeful or nice, but he does. I love the ending because you realize only, I think, with the ending that you've never actually seen them together. Because there's finally an image that appears. The photograph is developed at the... uh, There, I went and spoiled the great final shot. (laughs) which is a very important plot point. The existence of the evidence of their affair is finally appears at the very end of the film in the development of this photograph. And it's just such a beautiful, poetic way to end the film that it works perfectly for me. It also ties perfectly back to what I was saying before about how They think that it's going to go perfectly and according to plan, and it almost does, but there's just one tiny detail that trips them up in the end, and I think it's so fascinating. Well, in some ways, that's the definition of noir. That's sort of it, right? You think you're going to get away with it, you think you figured it out, and no. One of the words that keeps popping up in the discussion is maturity. The way that they play the older, grown, resolutely adult couple against the completely harebrained ridiculousness of the more teenaged early 20s couple in this movie. I absolutely love just how at the end, she's thinking to herself, 10 years isn't that long of a period of time. Whereas the kids earlier in the film are going, I'm going to be caught. I'm going to go away forever. That's the end of life. And just that juxtaposition of the mature viewpoint of just saying, I'm an adult. I will get through this versus I am a youth and this is the end of my life. It's such an interesting sort of very French commentary, actually. (laughs) That's a great observation. It's also interesting to note that the question of youth, like reckless youth, it's so fascinating to see it all around cinema in the 1950s because it was everywhere. I mean, obviously, Hollywood had their juvenile delinquent films, Blackboard Jungle, and all the movies that came out where it was, do you know what your teenagers are up to, and blah, blah, blah. 
And then you see it in a movie like this, and there's certainly other French films of the time that focused on this. And in Japan, there was a whole genre of films called Sun Tribe movies that were about youth run wild. It all had to do with kids having no real faith in civilization in the wake of World War II. You can't sell us the same stuff that you sold us before because we've seen how incredibly bad it can get, especially when you look at Japan. They had atomic bombs dropped on them. So it's like the kids mm -hmm. are like, what? There's some kind of rule we're supposed to follow, really? I just found that whole thing very fascinating about the 1950s, the way movies dealt with young people and their restlessness and recklessness. Another thing that stands out as far as the younger couple is their disregard for others. One of the most heightened scenes for me is the scene where the boy escapes and is trying to get away from Jean Moreau and she's chasing him, trying to get him to confess to the crimes that her lover is about to be blamed for. Like, he's not in enough trouble already. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's honestly one of the funniest scenes, too. Just imagining this. I don't know exactly how old John was at the time, but imagining this almost middle aged woman just running after this 20 something kid, or if that, all across town in a car and a motorcycle. <laughs> just catch me if you can right in the middle of this movie. <laughs> when she wakes them up in the apartment and it's like, you idiot, you didn't take enough to actually kill yourselves. What's the matter with you? It's a very bleak, but very funny joke. <laughs> yeah. Just all of it. They plan it all so poorly, and she just shows them immediately. I feel like I'm on Noir Alley now. I do just want to give a shout out to the cinematographer, Henri Decay, who is just, the imagery in this movie is just so incredibly spectacular, moving in a way. Something he captures in those Parisian streets is indelible. Once you've seen this movie, you carry those images with you forever. With that, I have to get everybody's final thoughts. What do you take away from this movie? Do you recommend it? Emily, what do you think? This is my first foray into French film noir. And as someone who just really loves the genre in American cinema, I'm so excited to perhaps pick Eddie's brain for a list of films that I should be watching in order to get better versed in this because this was so French and so post-World War II and so mysterious and vibey and atmospheric and wonderful that I'm just so excited to experience more. I loved it. Wow. Emily, you made my day. Yay! <laughs> no, just because I get very enthusiastic speaking with young people who are discovering this stuff for the first time. This is a great film. There are other equally great films out there waiting to be discovered. Some of them are famous. You have all of Jean-Pierre Melville's movies to look forward to. But there's a lot of unknown noir films or lesser known noir films that are just so spectacular, made in the 40s, in the 50s, I mean, all the way back to the 30s. I don't know if you've seen Pepe Lamoco with Gabin by Julien Duvivier, which is just an incredible movie. Very early proto-noir, made in 1936 or 7. But all of these movies are just so wonderfully fantastic. And the pleasure of being able to compare them to their U.S. brethren. When I was growing up, there was definitely, the scale was tipped towards the French side. Art house cinema was held to be superior to the Hollywood movies for many of the reasons that we've talked about today. There was more maturity. They didn't have to subscribe to various tropes. But to think that the French didn't love all that stuff, <laughs> and still do to this day, it's very special to have the opportunity to watch. If you haven't seen Rififi, the heist picture by Jules Dassin, that's just extraordinary. It's the greatest heist movie ever made. And it's especially French, but it owes so much to the asphalt jungle, which is why the book was written in the first place by Auguste Le Breton, 
he so loved the asphalt jungle that he wrote this novel. And Melville was going to make the movie, but then he said, no, you should actually have Dassin direct this because he was blacklisted in, in exile from the States. And so he got the chance to direct this movie and act in it as well. And he's just tremendous. Anyway, if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. I'll get you a list, Emily. You got a lot of movie watching to do. I was about to say, I couldn't find a pencil. I was so upset. (laughs) (laughs) Don't don't worry. Don't worry. That one is such a great one to point out. It went on to inspire so much too. Tarantino, of course, so famously. Yes, it's a perfect movie. In my estimation, Rafifi is a perfect film. I don't know if you guys would agree. I think this one goes up there too. I'm a novice to French noir too. I'm going to be the first one to say it, but I loved it. It was fantastic. I'm so glad that you guys are doing this. Well, introducing introducing these people. movies to people on Noir Alley. So when you saw it on Noir Alley, I did that one with Alicia, right? We co-hosted that, that yeah, show. because it was part of TCM Imports, I believe. You went straight from Noir Alley to TCM Imports. Yeah, those were the good old days when oh, Alicia yeah. and I could be on the set at the same time. They put the kibosh on the hosts being in the same place at the same time, unless mm-hmm. we're on the Warner Brothers lot celebrating the 100th anniversary of Warner Brothers. Then we all get to be there at the same time. Bummer. But oh. I'm telling you, we would like nothing better than than to introduce movies together. It would be so much fun. I don't know if you saw it when Ben and I did the neo-noir series a couple of summers ago. That was really fun. Plus, we love to do that because then we aren't working from a script. We're just talking like we're talking right now. Then the editors have to really work hard <laughs> to make something coherent out of what we're saying. Because but it's great fun. Casablanca this year at the fest was pretty incredible. I'm glad you thought so. That was a wonderful... I thank Ben for that, because I wasn't actually supposed to do that, and I just happened to be in the house, and Ben said, you need to come out and introduce this with me. It was his show to do, and he just dragged me out on stage, and we just talked. I love that. I want to see you and Jacqueline introduce a movie sometime. I don't know if noir and silent ever cross paths. But. Oh, we have tried, we have conspired to make that happen because there is a lot of silent. I'm actually on the advisory council of the San Francisco Silent Film Festival. I have a introduction coming up for a silent film called The Organist at St. Vitus Cathedral, which is a Czech film made in 1929 that certainly has its noirish elements. So They always ask me to come and introduce the film that is most like a noir, but was made in the silent era. I've always talked with Jacqueline about how fun it would be to do like a night of silent noir. Or like precursors, things that led to noir. I think that'd be such a good idea. We're putting that in the suggestion box. Great. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of silent films. There's a lot of pre-code films. There's a lesser amount once the code was reinforced in 1934. There were less things that I would call noir, proto-noir. You only live once and stuff like that. But I stand accused. People all the time are saying, Eddie showed this and it's not really noir. What's he doing? He's off of rocker if he thinks this is a film noir. Many years ago, long before I got this gig at TCM, I realized if I got to call it noir to get people to watch it, I'm going to call it noir. (laughs) And then in my introduction, I'll say, well, this is how it doesn't quite qualify. But you're here. You're here watching it. (laughs) At a certain point, that's what matters. I just want people to see this stuff. And in some occasions... The film that isn't really noir is the one that best explains what noir is because you're noticing, well, it would have been more noir if this happened or if that happened. It's like, yeah, exactly. That's why this isn't, but it was still worth watching, right? So, Eddie, I have one more question to ask you before we wrap up. I know you have your book, Eddie Muller Noir Bar. I don't believe Elevator to the Gallows is in it, correct? No, no, it's not. What would you drink to Elevator to the... I would drink probably a pastis, just a pastis or a pernol or something, because 
it's a thing in France that is kind of a before dinner you'll have a little pastis, which is kind of interesting because it comes out kind of yellowish and clear, and then if you put ice in it, it gets cloudy. It's like absinthe in a way. It's reminiscent of absinthe, but it's not as legendarily mind altering. <laughs> <laughs> That's absent. That would be it. Because when you're in Paris, everywhere you go, all the ashtrays and everything are all Richard, Richard, which is the manufacturer of the pastis and the Pernod and all this stuff. I could just see Jean Moreau stopping in one of these little cafes for a quick pastis. That's what I would. Which is not a cocktail. It's not a cocktail. It's just the drink itself. Just straight. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what she needs to kill her sorrows while she waits for Julian. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Eddie. This has been so fun. I want to give you the chance to plug anything you want to plug that's upcoming. I know you just talked about the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, which is so great. What else do you have going on? In a matter of days, I will be in Philadelphia at the Colonial Theater in, in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, for Noir City, Philadelphia. The three day. Oh, fantastic. We'll see you there, Samantha. Excellent. I don't know if I'm going to be there for all five of the double features, but I'm at least making one or two. Brilliant. So you will see me there. That's coming up. The cocktail book is doing very, very well. I'm happy about that. Later in the summer, in late August, I'm doing Noir City in Chicago. And then in September, there's a Noir City in Detroit. And in October, there's a Noir City in Washington, D.C. All these things are lined up. I'll leave you with this one because this is pretty funny. In September, I am coming out with a children's book. Wow. Uh, And it is noir, kid noir, Kitty Farrell and the Case of the Marshmallow Monkey. It's actually a book about a, a feline detective. The idea behind this, before people think, what's wrong with this guy? He's milking the noir thing for all it's worth. The idea behind this was very simple. You got to get them young, right? So a mystery story in black and white, an illustrated mystery story in black and white for kids, my hope is that they will love it and they will relate when they see a black and white film, they'll say, oh, that's like that book that I loved when I was, because this is a book for four to eight-year-olds. Rest assured, Eddie always has an ulterior motive. You have to adjust people's expectations a little bit to get them to watch these films, and then they realize how much they can love them. To me, this was a fun way to do that, was to give kids something that looks like classic noir when they're four years old. Little Susie doesn't kill Bobby and bury him in the sandbox or anything (laughs) like that, you know? They wouldn't allow me to do that. That's the young adult version. <laughs> the R.L. Stein version. Is it available for pre-order now? Perhaps. I haven't really checked. I mean, I've been so overwhelmed with stuff to do with the cocktail book, I haven't really checked in on the kids' book, which I think is pub date is sometime in September. Great. Awesome. Well, we'll just tell our listeners to keep a sharp eye out for it. It was a great pleasure talking to both of you. I enjoyed this very much, and I hope we can do it again sometime. That closes out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter, so leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Ticklish Biz. You can follow me at Classic Film Geek on Twitter. And you can find my blog at musingsofaclassicfilmatic.com. Emily, where can fans find and get in touch with you? I am trying to get my name on all the new platforms and hopefully the handle at Ms. Emily Edwards works pretty much everywhere. See you on Twitter, Blue Sky, Threads, Instagram. Who knows yeah, what tomorrow may like bring? These social media platforms are popping up on the daily, but we're going to try to get everywhere. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our doubled features and based on a true podcast series. So consider helping us at patreon.com slash Ticklish Biz. And don't forget Kristen's book, but have you read the book, is now out wherever you buy books. We'll be returning with a new episode in two weeks. See you then.